to order for an adjustment of the local room occupancy excise rate under Mass General Laws Chapter 64G, Section 3A, and acceptance of Mass General Laws Chapter 64G, Sections 3D A, 3D B, uh, allowing cities and towns to impose a community impact fee on short-term rentals. This matter was sponsored by our mayor, Mayor Martin J. Walsh, and referred to the Committee on Government Operations back on uh, April 10th of 2019. Uh, joining us uh, in order of their arrival to my left is City Council Eddie Flynn, to my right City Council Tim McCarthy, to my far left City Council Frank Baker, City Council Mark Siomo, and then to my far right City Council Lydia Edwards. Um, over the course of last year, uh, Mayor Walsh uh, and uh, his uh, the administration spent a significant amount of time working to ensure that the city of Boston regulated the short-term rental industry. Uh, the regulatory policies were passed by this body on June 2018 and went into effect as city law on January 1st of 2019. These policies were enacted to ensure that our neighborhoods were not negatively impacted by this growing industry and that the city would continue to meet its goals of expanding affordable housing opportunities. This particular order seeks to accept an adjustment of the local room occupancy excise rate by 0.05% uh, points to 6.5 for all lodging establishments. It additionally seeks to allow the city of Boston to adopt three local options. One, a local room occupancy excise up to 6.5 on all short-term rentals. Two, a local community impact fee of 3% on short-term rental stays in the units that are professionally managed. And three, an additional local community impact fee on short-term rental stays in locally defined, quote, owner adjacent units. These local excises and community impact fees will help mitigate and potent the potential impacts of short-term rentals on our long-term housing stock. Monies collected through these local excise and community impact fees will be a dedicated source of revenue for housing and homelessness efforts here in the city of Boston. So we're joined here today uh, by Justin Sterrett, the Director of Budget Office, Layla Bernstein, Deputy Director of Supportive Housing Division, and Marcy Ostberg, Director of Operations from D&D. So uh, I'll defer to you as to who we choose to start to get into a discussion on this matter. Thank you, Councillor. Um, uh and all the councilors for being here today. We really appreciate it uh, and for inviting us here to testify. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Justin Sterrett. I'm the City of Boston's Budget Director. Uh, we're here to offer testimony on docket 0644 that you laid out earlier, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm also joined by Leila Bernstein and Marcy Osberg from the Department of Neighborhood Development, who will get into the details of the specific investments for this funding, which we are excited to talk about. <clears throat> But just to give you a little background, um, docket 0644, just the local room occupancy excise on, under Mass General Law 64G, when the state undertook um, short-term rental law change earlier this year, uh, this is all to go in, into effect at the statewide level uh, on July 1st of 2019, so uh, soon, soon coming. Uh, this allows us to do three things, as you mentioned. Uh, adjust the entire room occupancy for both hotels, motels, and uh, new short-term rentals up to 6.5% local excise, and accept two local provisions to uh, assess community impact fees for short-term rentals on uh, owner-adjacent units and for professionally managed units. Uh, the orders that have been submitted today are vital to ensuring that the city can continue to invest in critical housing and homelessness efforts. As you all know, the city is limited in our ability to raise revenue, so we need to use the tools we have at our disposal in order to provide uh, world-class services to Bostonians as expected. Uh, as you all know, over 70% of our revenue comes from property taxes, which are capped at 2.5% on an annual basis. State aid continues to decline down about $12 million in FY20, and we are limited in what we uh, additional revenue streams we're able to collect. We do not assess a income tax like in New York City. We do not have a local sales tax like in a city like Denver, so we have to use the tools at our disposal to make sure that we have the revenue that we need. <clears throat> the order before you today will generate $5 million annually that we will be dedicating towards housing and homelessness programs and services. In FY20, this includes $4 million uh, to fund supportive housing creation and $1 million to support youth and young adult homelessness initiatives that my colleagues will get into in a minute. Uh, this investment will translate into a tremendous amount of new capacity to make investments in housing for years to come, nearly doubling DND's city-funded budget next year, which we think is a, a really big testament to the, the type of um, new revenue stream that this is going to find for us. 
Uh, but we are very mindful that, uh, as you all know, tourism continues to be a vital industry in Boston. It generates billions of dollars worth of economic impact, thousands of jobs, and hundreds of millions generated at the state and local level in terms of, of taxes. So we want to be very mindful of that industry. Uh, this room occupancy tax will still keep us below major competitive cities like San Francisco, Chicago, New York, Houston. So we, we are confident that this will remain competitive. And the effect on an average nightly rental is about a dollar. So while that is not um, sort of an insignificant amount of money it is um, small and we think that because of the the city's already high hotel occupancy rates we don't anticipate this uh, slight increase to have any effect on that uh, if this order is passed it will go into effect uh, with the state law on July 1st uh, and with that I will turn it over to Layla and Marcy to talk through some of the specific investments Good morning, counselors. Thank you for having me here today. My name is Marcy Osberg. I'm the Director of Operations at Department of Neighborhood Development. At DND, we work to build strong, inclusive communities with access to stable and affordable housing for all. To do this, um, we have a budget that's just over $100 million. This year is the first year with this increase that it'll be at 105. Um, and to, to do this, we work to create and preserve affordable housing, which is $39.2 million of our FY20 budget. We have efforts to end homelessness, which is $38.3 million, strengthen home ownership, $12 million, prevent displacement and stabilize housing, $2.6 million, and managing and disposing of city-owned property with $2.7 for a total of $105 million. Um, these, 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 this budget is broken into different sources. So from external grants, we get 64.9 million next year. And in this political cl climate, we fight tooth and nail to keep those funds um, every year. And we also have 20.1 million from IDP. And our city operating budget is what's so exciting today that we're seeing an increase from 14.2 million in FY19 to, to in FY20, 20.6 million um, from city operating. That's a 45% increase. Um, we're really excited about the opportunity that that creates to help more homeless individuals. And Lila will tell us more about how we plan to use that funding. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity um, to uh, talk a little bit about the work we're doing around ending homelessness in the city. So my name is Lila Bernstein. I am the deputy director for the supportive housing division at DND. I'm also advisor to the mayor for the initiative to end chronic homelessness. Um, and as you, as you all know very well, in October of 2014, the bridge um, that leads to Long Island was condemned and the city's largest emergency homeless shelter had to be relocated immediately. At that time, um, Mayor Walsh took the opportunity to convene a task force, not just to look at the current crisis in front of him um, and in front of all of us, but to also think about how we're ending homelessness in the city of Boston, not just addressing the crisis of homelessness. So as a, as a result of that work um, of the task force, the mayor released an action plan to end veteran and chronic homelessness in June of 2015. So I'm gonna describe a little bit about the outcomes of that plan and why it is we're looking for additional funds to create permanent supportive housing to um, continue to achieve results. Um, before I do that, I, I need to define a few terms. So chronic homelessness is long-term homelessness among people with um, some form of what the federal government terms a disabling condition. So that might be a, a substance use disorder, it might be a long-term mental health condition, it might be a physical disability. Um, and it's a, it's a small subset of people experiencing homelessness. It, it tends to be nationally, it's about 10% of the homeless population fits this definition of chronic homelessness, but use almost 50% of the sheltering resources because they're consistently experiencing homelessness. So it's a very vulnerable population, but it's also a population that um, is um, being served quite a bit by, by the homeless response system. Another definition is, this de is, a, is to define permanent supportive housing. Permanent supportive housing is um, long-term subsidized, deeply subsidized housing with supportive services that are um, offered to the tenants in that housing. And the supportive services focus on helping people maintain their tenancy. 
Um, and then last, housing first is a policy approach that offers housing without preconditions. Um, so the way that we end chronic homelessness in the city of Boston, the way that we are going to do that is by um, having enough permanent supportive housing and using a housing first approach. Um, housing first is in contrast to previous methods of, of um, working with people who are experiencing homelessness, which um, we've moved away from, which used to be uh, more about compliance in a program, asking people to get sober before um, they were offered housing or um, you know, making sure they were part of a treatment plan and uh, comply with rules sometimes for many years before housing was offered. This really reverses it and says, housing's a, a basic right and um, People need a platform of stability before they can start to look at other issues that, that they may want to work on. So um, the, the action plan has changed how we do business on, um, on responding to homelessness as a city, but also um, the community of providers that work on homelessness. So um, we're, we're much more data driven now. We are much more um, collaborative across agencies and bureaucracies. Um, for example, there is a weekly meeting that is convened at D&D &D and um, representatives from Boston Public Health Commission come, Boston Healthcare for the Homeless, Boston Housing Authority, um, the Department of Mental Health, Pine Street Inn, their street outreach team and their housing team, um, and many, many other providers. And what they do is they sit and look at the list of names of people who are experiencing chronic homelessness in the city of Boston. That's a list that we pull out of our database. And they work on how to get those folks housed. Um, so that that is a is dramatically different from how things were working uh, um, just a few years ago. So um, we're through that method and and other um, uses of technology and, and different ways in which we're collaborating. We're ensuring that people who've experienced homelessness the longest are offered vacancies as they come up in our existing permanent supportive housing portfolio. Um, and and through this work, we've also leveraged or created 300 new units of permanent supportive housing. Um, and we've, we've been quite successful. So when we started the effort, um, there were 612 chronically homeless individuals uh, in, in the city of Boston. And since then, we've housed 735 chronically homeless individuals, representing ending 4,000 years, over 4,000 years of homelessness. However, we are not at zero chronic homelessness. Um, that was the, the intention of, that was the goal of the mayor's action plan, which was to span from 2015 to 2018. And um, we, you know, we housed more people than were on that original list, but every time we go to run a new list, new names appear. So it's clear that the demand for permanent supportive housing is outstripping our supply. We, we've been able to reduce chronic homelessness by over 20% over the last three years. Um, um, and that's at a time where the um, number of chronically homeless individuals across the country has gone up. Um, in, between 2016 and 2017, it increased by 12%. So we're bending uh, the trend in the right direction in Boston, but we are not at zero. Um, and we, we certainly need more resources to create more of this permanent supportive housing um, and, and create more of a pipeline ongoing. So four million of the revenue raised from this proposal will have that direct impact of creating more permanent supportive housing um, and it will amplify the, the work that we're already doing. Um, I also want to mention we asked um, Eric Lipovetsky um, to, to um, come today and, and he's going to provide testimony later um, and he currently lives in permanent supportive housing run by Pine Street Inn and is one of those 735 individuals that was housed through this uh, mayor's initiative um, and he's a phenomenal speaker and, and we'll tell you a little bit about his journey um, a little bit later on. We also invited Amy Coolidge who's vice president um, of community and government relations for Pine Street Inn uh, to to talk about the impact that funding from this proposal would have. Um, I also want to address the other one million. Um, so, so the proposal is that four million will go to create permanent supportive housing for chronically homeless individuals. The other, the remaining million um, is to be spent on ending homelessness among youth and young adults. 
so last spring, D&D &D launched a planning process around um, creating a strategic plan or a community plan um, to prevent and end homelessness among youth and young adults. And in the next few weeks, that plan will be released. The mayor will be releasing that plan publicly. Um, on any given night, there's over 350 young people experiencing homelessness um, in our city. Um, and, and we did receive a large federal grant for this effort. We received $4.9 million for the next two years to support housing interventions um, to end youth homelessness. But what I've learned over the last year and a half is that um, it, homelessness among youth and young adults is, is quite different from chronic homelessness and that the uh, response is primarily not to build permanent supportive housing, but instead to provide opportunity. Um, these are young people. Often, they are, um, their their education has been interrupted. They haven't yet built a strong work history, and um, it is our our job and our duty as a city to create those opportunities, and that will be part of their pathway out of homelessness. Um, so the. Um, there, you know, we're looking at our systems and, and how existing resources work for youth and young adults, but we know that um, especially youth and young adults who are, who are experiencing homelessness often fall through the cracks of existing resources, and we're looking for this one million to help repair some of that. Um, so we're going to be, d and is working together closely with HHS and BPS um, to to make sure that these funds don't duplicate anything that already exists, but um, but does create opportunities for youth and young adults to exit homelessness. So in conclusion, the, the increase in the hotel tax would serve um, the most vulnerable folks in our community, um, and in doing so would move us closer to ending homelessness in Boston. Thank you. Well, thank you, Justin. Um Marcy and, and Layla. Uh, I also recognize uh, our uh, Commissioner of uh, Inspectional Services, Buddy Christopher, is here astutely listening in. And when I see him, I think about um, he oversees obviously the rental registration and uh, would obviously have a role in um, in this regulation as well. It also reminds me of the Jim Brooks stabilization piece where um, try to the data collection, I guess, if you will. So we've heard a lot. Of, uh, we've discussed the several different sort of pools of millions um, so I guess like how, how are you able to estimate the amount of revenue that this will generate do we currently have a database of all Airbnb type of properties, short-term rental properties or are we sort of just sort of taking a poke at what we think is out there sure. <coughs> it'll join you just keep talking the vast majority of this new five million will come from the existing lodging establishments. So those are mostly hotels and motels throughout the city. We are um, actively implementing the new ordinance that went into effect earlier this year um, to start the registry and to start collecting that data. But the the, the city already collects about a hundred million dollars worth of um, local occupancy. So this 0.5 percentage increase is based on the existing revenue figures that we already collect. So we're pretty confident that we'll collect the full five million. Um, the vast majority of it will come from the existing hotels, though. Right. And when the short-term rental thing gets ironed out mm -hmm. uh, between the state level and potential litigation, what have you, those that would, I would argue that those are conservative estimates. So you're basing that on sort of your existing yes. portfolio of mm -hmm. hotels and other, other taxable items as the five million. But yes. that's probably there's going to be an upside to that. Yes, uh, uh, budgeters are naturally conservative, so we um, we we don't want to overpromise. But I think once the uh, look, especially the, the um, the community impact fee of, of which a portion will need to go to housing related efforts. I think the city is actually going above and beyond just what the state is allowing by dedicating the full five million of this right. new funding to right. housing efforts. And then so and where would that be housed? Is that uh, who would oversee that? Is that something that inspectional service is very much like the rental registration mm -hmm. and very much like the Jim Brooks stabilization? Uh, sure. Is that something that so the excise money comes in as general fund dollars and just gets appropriated. Um, this year it's been appropriated to D&D's budget to do the five million that um, Marcy and Layla laid out. I think in future years we're still working out exactly the mechanism by which we're going to collect the community impact fee. We're waiting for some additional guidance from the state. Uh, the law goes into effect on July 1st. So we're trying to get our ducks in a row to make sure that when um, July 1 hits, we're ready to um, accept the funding, whatever, whatever form it comes right. in from the state. So we'll be going into the general fund. Would it be given a name similar to like the parking meter fund? Would this be sort of the short-term rental fund? 
Um, so I, I don't think we've uh, gotten guidance from whether this will be a special revenue account or whether this will just be general fund dollars yet from the state. I think the intention will be that we need to demonstrate back to them that the funding is being used uh, in some capacity to go towards housing. So we'll, we'll definitely have those um, funds ironed out. I think the commitment from the administration and the mayor is that the five million in excise dollars that's gonna come in uh, as a part of this overall ordinance, that will go back to DND's budget on an annual basis. And in the first year, it's going towards homelessness efforts, but in future years, it's gonna to go towards other housing efforts, whether it's housing creation, tenant pre tenancy preservation, other areas of D&D's portfolio that they oversee. And then what about uh, overhead uh, cost staffing, um, mm -hmm. sort of, I guess on the oversight and regulatory So I think the, um, the biggest things we're working right now with are, are data that's working with Do It and, and Commissioner Christopher's office to um, make sure that the, the systems are in place. We did add two new dedicated short-term rental housing inspectors in the upcoming FY20 budget to make sure that um, people are playing by the rules and that everyone is um, sort of on a level playing field. So that's uh, the staffing we've added for it, but we think that a lot of this will be driven by data and, and So between technology. those two positions, can you estimate sort of a ballpark cost of those positions plus sure. any other So the, the cost of that, uh, those two positions was about $100,000. Um, obviously that'll depend a little bit uh, once we get them posted and, and filled. Uh, the IT system, I would have to get back to you on exactly what the cost is, but that's something that was budgeted for in FY19 that we've already started to uh, implement. Great, and then there's uh, pending, uh, I guess, will pending legislation, uh, litigation, will pending litigation have any impact whatsoever with the city's ability to collect the funds? Um, we don't believe so. There's uh, obviously an active um, court case going on right now that affects some of the provisions of it, but not all of them. We think that um, we feel pretty confident that that this action that we're proposing or um, we're putting in front of you today is uh, outside the bounds of what the, the litigation is on. Okay. Uh, my colleagues, Councilor Red Flynn. Thank you, Council Flaherty, and um, thank you to the panelists for for being here. Um, Justin, when was the last time the city um, increased or received permission to um, increase the hotel motel tax? Uh, so the the increase was um, given to us back in 2009 by the state. At that time, we went from four to 6%. Uh, we did not go to the full 6.5%, but given the changes to the uh, room occupancy level at the state, uh, at the state house, um, we decided to take a look at the kind of the hol holistic approach and, and sort of as we were implementing the short-term rental piece, um, wanted to level the playing field for everyone at 6.5%. Thank you. And um, I just had a couple questions on the housing, housing piece. Um, is there any designated uh, funding for uh, veteran housing, um, helping our homeless veterans get into uh, different different apartments or locations around the city? Um, um, and actually, there's a hearing later today on on um, housing for homeless veterans, and I'll be addressing that. But there, there's actually quite a bit of federal funding um, coming in for housing for homeless veterans. And um, we've seen a even greater impact on reducing homelessness among veterans through that investment of, of additional federal funds. Um, we've decreased homelessness among veterans by 39% since 2014, which, it, which we, haven't, we haven't seen that same type of decrease across the general population, but we have seen it um, among veterans. Um, and we've also as uh, invested city resources into housing projects specifically for homeless veterans. So one of those housing projects was at New England Center and Homes for Veterans, I'm sure you're aware. Um, they created efficiency units that are quite beautiful across the plaza, City Hall Plaza. Um, there is a project that's in, in progress right now on the Brighton Marine campus that will be specifically for homeless veterans. Um, and Patriot Homes also opened in the last few years, um, which is affordable housing for, for veterans. There's one other that I'm forgetting um, that, that was developed recently as well, and I'll have my notes this afternoon. No, thank, um, thank you for that. We had, a, we had an opportunity with um, Councilor Edwards yesterday to um, talk about some of these issues, homeless veteran issues. Um, so that's an important issue um, for us, and I know the, the I, I think that's the, one of the best things the city has done is really making sure that our homeless veterans are able to get access to housing and um, job training programs, employment, um, social services as well. So I wanna say thank you to the administration for your work on um, helping our veterans and, and military families. Um, can you talk about, I, I was at the um, 
um, grant announcement a, a year ago. I believe it was the Bridge Over Troubled Waters, um, downtown Boston. They got a HUD grant. Um, I think it was for $3 million or $4 million last year. Could you give us a little background on information on that program? Absolutely, yeah. So that is, uh, um, I, I believe you're referring to the $4.9 million grant yeah. that we announced at Bridge Over Troubled Waters last summer. Um, and that is specifically to fund the housing interventions that will be part of this community strategic plan on ending homelessness among youth and young adults. Um, so because it's money coming from HUD, it, it really is locked in to be um, spent on housing. And um, like I said, there will be, there's some small group of uh, youth and young adults experiencing homelessness who maybe can't exit homelessness without, without permanent supportive housing. But most of the housing interventions that we anticipate we'll, we'll spend that funding on will be um, more short term than that. It'll be a, essentially a bridge to, um, to, stable housing that, that youth could afford on their own. So it, it would be more likely um, a few years of assistance in the private market paired with opportunities to um, access employment and education so that within a few years, um, youth and young adults are able to increase their income and afford their own housing. No, thank you, and I know during your opening comments you mentioned um, um, our friends from Pine Street Inn that are here, I had the opportunity to talk to Eric and to, I know Amy very well, and I'm proud that Pine Street is um, in my district, along with St. Francis House, uh, New England Center for Homeless Veterans, um, Boston Rescue, mm -hmm. and Rosie's Place is just outside of my district. Um, but I'm proud of the, um, the great work our housing advocates are doing in my district, but more importantly, across, across our city. So I want to give a... Um, say thank you to them as well. And again, thank you to the panelists for, for your leadership on this important issue. Thank you, Councilor Tim McCarthy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and welcome. Um, twice in one day, Justin, lucky me. <laughs> um, just a quick question regarding the $4 million uh, for uh, permanent housing. Um, this is new permanent housing, understood. Are we working with the BHA? And the reason why I ask that is <clears throat> we have three BHA developments in, in District 5. Um, we have uh, Archdale, which is worn down. We have High Park, which is even more worn down. And then we have Beach Street, which was redone through a Hope Six grant, which is immaculate. Um, more people, they've built a community there. It's a wonderful place to live. And, and I would argue that 10 years ago, if you said to anybody in Rosendale, hey, um, we'll you know, bring our kids down and we'll meet you at the Beach Street Developments mm -hmm. playground, you would have said, you're out of your mind. I'll never go to that playground. It's mm -hmm. all run down. Now, it is a location at a destination point. Are we working with BHA to upgrade some of the, the locations we have now? Mm -hmm. So I'll take a stab at that one. Um, so uh, I think you, you hit a uh, nail on the head. Hope six, there is no hope seven, right? So right. we've really had to, to figure out. Not anytime soon. Not anytime soon, at least. Um, so we've really had to try to think about how we are going to step in and fill in the gaps left behind by the federal government. I think we were really proud to dedicate uh, $35 million of the Winthrop Square Garage to Orient Heights and to Old Colony. We are absolutely ecstatic to announce in the capital plan next week, which um, we, we will be talking a lot more about, a $30 million commitment to the One Charlestown project, uh, which is obviously a BHA site. And I think as we sort of continue to see the landscape of what happens on the federal level, um, the city's going to have to step up and, and take on more responsibility than we used to. That's obviously a challenge. We have a limited capital plan at the end of the day, and, and we probably don't have the wherewithal to do every site, so we're going to need partners, whether it's at the state or the federal level. Um, but we, we know that it's too important to wait on some of these um, either investments in new places or in refurbishments, so we have to, we have to start on some of the backlog. Okay. Thank you. And I'll just add, um, we, we're partnering with BHA on, on these initiatives, and some of that, the, I, I mentioned that we had leveraged 300 new units of permanent supportive housing. Some of those are BHA units that we then brought in services into the units so that they could be offered as a permanent supportive housing package to people who had experienced chronic homelessness. So the BHA had set aside uh, 90 units for chronically homeless elders, and it's been a very successful uh, effort. It's a finite stock of housing, and so, um, um, it's not growing, but it is, BHA is partnering with us to dedicate some of that housing to the most vulnerable among us. Yeah, and just to add on, you know, when you said it's not growing, that was my point with some of these developments. You know, uh, 
we working with uh, private developers, and we, we were on our track that way with uh, mm -hmm. Archdale, with a private developer, where they would build a building, move people from one building into the other, mm -hmm. raise that building, build another building, mm -hmm. move people over so they wouldn't be displaced at any yeah. point in time, but adding units to each develop each new building, and that way you can continue and, and make uh, another, again, a lot like Beach Street, really a, its own community. So, mm -hmm. thank you. Chair recognizes Councilor Frank Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everybody. Um, can you talk a little bit about, uh, uh, so are we, as the city, building any any units that the city owns and maybe leases back to Pine Street? How, how are we, when you say we're building, I'm familiar with some, um, some of the models, like at um, St. Peter's, private de private developer builds it out, leases back. Is is that how we're building this stock? Can you explain some of the different models for me? Sure, that is the model. Essentially, is that we procure the the money out, and um, partnerships come come back and um, bid on the f the funds, uh, compete for the funds, and then they have to leverage funding from other sources as well, including the state. So um, Pine Street Inn is probably the largest developer of, of permanent supportive housing. They often team up with other entities to, de to develop this type of housing, so they'll, they'll speak more to their yeah. model. Um, but there are other, um, St. Francis House yeah. just developed uh, 48 Boylston, and some of those units are permanent supportive housing units. Um, so it's city funding that goes into these projects, but the city doesn't own the building in the end. Okay, and, and so with the um, youth homelessness, would that be the same model? Are we trying to do that sort of model also? And that would, and that, if I heard correctly, would be to provide an opportunity for someone that, that may have, you know, left high school or whatever, try and get them, so w the wraparound services would be high school and possibly job training, and here's how you, you may live. So it's not... It's not um, long-term supportive housing for that for that youth population. That's correct, and and typically um, with with the funding that we receive, we do procure it out, and nonprofits mm -hmm. compete for the, for the funding to provide those types of services no, so, or housing. So, so the builder there has to come to D and D and say, "We're doing this project here, and we'd like to." Um, apply for X amount of dollars to help us to just kind of supplement what they're doing. That's right. In, in, in the case of youth and young adults, we probably won't be building a lot of yeah. additional housing, but it may be that there are um, providers like Bridge Over Troubled Waters or Pine Street Inn actually serve some youth in their mm -hmm. um, population and, and others um, who will bid for the, the whatever model it is that we've determined is um, needed, mm -hmm. and, and they'll provide the services or the housing assistance. Okay, thank you. Justin, what do you, and, and I don't know if Council Flaherty asked this already, what do you, what do you foresee coming from Airbnb um, income on this, where we, where we limited Airbnb? How much, is, how much do you think is going to be there? Do you have a sense of that? Um, we, we don't quite yet. We're obviously still ramping up to register, well, we're registering folks, but we're also ramping up for the state law to go into effect. I think the 3% community host impact fee is, um, there's two different parts of it. There's the owner adjacent ones, which we do allow under the city ordinance, and the investor units, which we don't allow. So we obviously don't expect any revenue from the um, owner investor units, but we do, I'm sorry, the investor units, but we do expect revenue from the owner side. We're, um, we're still waiting to see what the market develops on the registry side. And frankly, um, more information from the state as they start to collect it on July 1st, we'll, we'll have a better sense, um, you know, as we get into next fiscal year. And, and, and what's going on with the, the companies that were existing that have been doing <clears throat> corporate rentals for however many years they were doing it. Has that, has that business fallen off? Is that coming, is that coming under the Airbnb uh, regulations? Uh, that's a great, great question. I'm gonna have to defer to uh, either Commissioner Christopher or um, the mayor's office to get us an exact answer on that one, but uh, I'm sure they could speak to okay, that. Okay, well, we can, maybe Christine, we can do yeah. a follow up with yeah. Justin or whatever, just to see what, yeah. get a sense of what's, what's happening, what is happening with that business trends. Um, yeah, but thank you. Definitely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. Chair recognizes Council Liddy Redwoods. Thank you, very much. Thank you for being here today. Um, I just had some, uh, just some clarifying questions. Um, first, the amount about is about six million, correct? Uh, so we're projecting about five million dollars to be million. collected from the room occupancy change. Okay, and this is on an annual basis. Yep. So, um, and as I think uh, Council Flaherty had noted, this is an, a conservative conservative estimate. 
I, th I think it, um, like all local revenue, it is um, dependent a little bit on the economy. So it's based on what the average room rental rate is in Boston. So if that mm -hmm. goes up, that certainly could be conservative. But if it goes down, we do have some downside risk potentially. Okay. And then just um, some, some follow-up questions on um, homelessness in, uh, in Boston. So I recall when I worked at DND, a majority of the homeless folks who are here in Boston are not from Boston. Is that still correct? Yeah, yeah from the data that we have, so people who report their um, permanent last known address, uh, more than half are reporting zip codes from outside of Boston. So, and I mean, it's, um, we're a hub. So I, I, I recall, you know, a lot of our shelters are filled with folks who are not from Boston, a lot of folks seeking even from OHS. Uh, a lot of the resources that we're using was for a, a transient population, but majority of our homeless are not from Boston then, still. That is still the case. When it comes to chronically homeless individuals, those are folks, you know, we are, we're really only looking at people who've experienced chronic homelessness in Boston. Mm -hmm. So at that point, someone has been homeless in Boston for in a Boston year or longer. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a little, you know, their zip code of last known address once before when they had a permanent address, um, many of them were from outside of Boston, but now they've been homeless in Boston for a year or longer. And so, um, and of the budget that uh, you had mentioned, Marcy, a $38 million already is going to homelessness in Boston, right, mm -hmm. uh, of D&D's budget. And that, that's including staff, that's including uh, resources, but then also direct grants to, I don't know, to, to several of the nonprofits, to Pine Street, so on and so forth. So it's a combination of that 38 that goes out. That's right. And Lila, you could actually speak more closely to the existing budget. Yeah, so primarily those are federal funds that come in, and the vast majority of those funds pay for long-term housing vouchers that leverages services. So we, we do have, um, I think, about 1,400 units of permanent supportive housing um, that, that's paid for through that grant, um, among other things, and those units are full. So there, you know, there's a little bit of turnover, and, and we use that turnover to house the most vulnerable folks on our list. But the, there, you know, there are people in that housing who have been there for 10, 20 years, um, and and will continue to be. So to have a pipeline of new housing that's being created is really how we're going to continue to reduce the numbers. Right, and I, I think my, my line of questioning is because I'm seeing 38 million dollars for homelessness, but only 2.6 for displacement, and because the population, the homeless population, majority of is not from Boston, but I do know at least all of the folks who are being displaced from Boston are from Boston. I'm, I'm wondering in terms of the prioritization, why isn't more funds of the $6 million going to prevent displacement in Boston? So, so I would maybe say, uh, to jump on a little bit, uh, I think the, the folks who are chronically homeless are, are on, on, I think, questionably, the most vulnerable citizens that we have in the Commonwealth, whether they're from Boston or whether they're from outside of the city. So mm -hmm. I think that um, finding them permanent supportive housing is, if not the top priority, if it's one of the top priorities of the, the mayor and certainly the department. Um, we also feel like this is an area where we can make a real difference in FY20. I think going into future years, this $5 million could go towards tenancy preservation, it could go towards housing creation, it could go towards other areas. This is um, where we think we can make a real market difference in FY20, but then also um, potentially redirect that to other housing efforts mm -hmm. in future fiscal years. The other, thing the other thing that I would note is that we do also have $39.2 million for housing production and preservation, which I do think is direct, directly relevant for displacement, because that's creating new income-restricted units where anyone at risk uh, and needing housing can, can find a place. Mm -hmm. And of course it's not enough, and that's why we're always seeking new funding sources like this one. Mm -hmm. But that is, that is a significant amount of money. Well, one, one way also, or that would also, I think, go to, I think, a, a common fund that has already been proven to be uh, incredibly impactful and is run by the city is the Neighborhood Housing Trust. So why not streamline this funding on an annual basis to the Neighborhood Housing Trust where uh, we can help buildings that are coming online already either buy down uh, the affordability so we can have more units at 30% AMI, therefore meeting some of the homeless set-aside uh, units requirements. Why not put it towards the Neighborhood Housing Trust, which where DND sits on there as a staff, then that fund goes directly to applicants and grant, you know, folks who are building right now mm -hmm. in Boston um, and making sure that some of that funding is available because it, it, it certainly is underfunded as well, mm -hmm. Neighborhood Housing Trust. 
I, I would say from a technical perspective, it's a little bit hard to, um, because this money is general fund dollars at the end of the day, it, it comes from the state, they collect it, they, they remit it back to us. It would be hard to figure out exactly what of this new 0.5 increase is exactly related to each um, hotel or, or whatever it happens to be. I think the, um, the, the point of putting it at DND was to more to give them the flexibility to move it between these different types of really critical policy areas on an annual basis. And I think um, the neighborhood uh, housing trust is certainly a, a great resource. This is going to give us the ability to kind of leverage other resources that DND has. This is also going to give us the ability to, if in one year it, it needs to go to the um, homelessness initiative, if next year there's a, a building thing that we have to do, there's just an opportunity to keep it um, in it. I think we'd also probably need state law change to redirect a general fund revenue source away from it, the same way we have um, special revenue accounts or other types of things. So it might be a little bit more complicated than just dedicating the money over somewhere else. Thoughts? Any other thoughts? Why not the Neighborhood Housing Trust? I mean, I would say that our divisions collaborate very closely, and so um, the supportive housing team and the neighborhood and the neighborhood housing development team work very closely together. And so, in this next year, we're really focused on making an impact on the the needs of the supportive housing. Um, uh, team and as Justin said that this could go for other services in the future but I think that we have needs all over the place um, yeah. yeah no I, I think I mean I don't I'm glad we're opting into this I'm just questioning the prioritization and where it's going to go um, not because I don't think D&D &D does amazing work I just think uh, when I think of short-term rentals uh, and the impact that they've had on, on our community, it has been to displace, it has been to prevent uh, certain folks from having access to units. So when I think in terms of this money, I think it's mitigation for what injury they're causing. Or so the injury is to displacement, it is the injury is to uh, folks trying to find a place in Boston. So that's how I see mm -hmm. uh, the money being prioritized for that. You just see it differently. Um, but that's, that's the only reason why I'm asking these questions. What's up? Thank you, uh, Councillor Edwards. Uh, and to sort of, uh, I guess, to um, check on to uh, Councillor Edwards, the census data that we get, it, so a significant uh, percentage of the homeless population, they're not from Boston? So uh, there's, a, there's a field that we ask, which is what was the zip code of your last known address in its self-report? We, we don't get that reported um, by a lot of folks, but for among the people that we, we do get that report, um, about 50% are not, or a little bit more than 50% are not from Boston. Like I said, when we're focusing on chronically homeless individuals, those are people who've already been homeless in Boston for a long time. So. Uh, you know, to say they're not from Boston right. is, is a little bit hard to say um, because they, they've now been in Boston for over a year. Um, and, you know, that field is last known permanent address. Some, some of the folks that uh, meet the definition of chronic homelessness haven't had a permanent address ever or in a long time. So um, there, there are certainly people who are homeless in Boston who were not born here or didn't didn't have a permanent address in Boston before that, but this is a highly vulnerable population. And one would, I guess, argue that um, the reason that um, those that are not from Boston are now in Boston is homeless because the resources are here. And mm -hmm. so I guess the question is, what, if any, conversations are you having with some of our suburban counterparts? You know, if you get an individual from, say, Melrose who's now homeless but is now in Boston, mm -hmm. what is Melrose doing to work with us? Are they reimbursing us? Like, those are the conversations. The affordable housing crisis and the yep. opioid crisis is falling on Boston shoulders. Absolutely. Our suburban neighbors and counterparts are not stepping up to the plate in creating affordable housing and or addressing the opioid crisis. Case in point, you referenced in the beginning, we're talking about the bridge. Uh, you do a census over there, I get you, there's a significant uh, mm -hmm. amount of them from Quincy, Squanum, uh, Howes Neck, Marymount, uh, et cetera, uh, yet it's kind of like not Quincy's problem. Mm -hmm. uh, it's everyone's problem. Uh, homeless crisis and the opioid crisis, uh, we all own it. We mm -hmm. all have a responsibility, but it cannot continue just to fall on Boston shoulders our suburban counterparts, uh, other agencies outside of Boston have to step up to the plate uh, and or these cities and towns have to start to talk about reimbursing Boston mm -hmm. 
for taking care of their children, for taking care of their residents. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know what, if any, discussions are happening at your level, but there's got to be a level of accountability Absolutely. Uh, from, from uh, again, suburban communities to, to do more. Absolutely. And we, we, as part of kind of looking at our data and looking at the dynamics within the homeless population, we've been in discussion with the state um, and where they have cited um, shelters and whether or not those shelters are serving the needs of the people outside of Boston um, well enough. And, and um, we, you know, we certainly are looking to have a more regional approach when we um, go to revise the, the action plan because of th those dynamics that there are, there are people who are seeking shelter in Boston because there's no shelter where they right. where they are. Right. Which um, which means that we're sort of never going to get ahead of it mm -hmm. because as we're getting close to getting ahead of it, we're more are going to come because again we're we're doing uh, the best we can and uh, to address the situation, but. Uh, Others need to, to, to do more as well, so. Absolutely. Um, so with that, we're gonna slide into uh, public testimony. You're welcome to stay right here. The public testimony uh, individuals who have asked to sign in uh, has been Amy Coolidge and uh, Eric uh, Lepopsky, and um, either one of those two um, open mics are yours for, uh, and if you could just state your name and affiliation for the record, and then you have the floor to give us your thoughts on uh, on this proposal. And anyone else here in the gallery wishing to offer public testimony may do so by either signing in the sign-in sheet or just feel free after um, Amy and Eric testify just to come right up to the microphone and offer public testimony. Good morning. Welcome, Amy. Um, my name is Amy Coolidge. I'm the Vice President of Community and Government Relations for Pine Street Inn um, and here very enthusiastically. Um, we, um, as, as I'm sure you know, we are um, known as an organization that serves homeless individuals. We serve 700 people in emergency shelter every day. Um, but more importantly and germane to this conversation is we um, serve 850 people in permanent supportive housing throughout Boston. Um, and these are, are units that are in 40 different locations throughout um, the city and Brookline as well. Um, I'm here today, we are in support um, of, of this proposal to dedicate this funding stream um, for permanent supportive housing. Um, we know it works. We've been doing it for over 30 years before there was even a name for it. Um, we, we've been in the micro unit business for a long time. Um, and I, I don't wanna, Lila talked a lot about um, I concur with everything she said. She did a great job at explaining the models and the, the systems that are in place. Um, and Eric is going to give you a much better glimpse um, into how it works as, as a tenant and a consumer of these services. So what he has to say is far more important, I think, and informative than, than what I have. But um, what we have found is, uh, as I said, we've been doing this for 30 years. Um, and then at one point, um, um, it, it sort of, the research um, came out not only locally but across the country that supports this type of housing. Um, and um, originally we were welcoming people in and just doing what we could to keep people safe and warm for a night and then getting them housing ready. Um, and when they were housing ready, which meant dealing with health issues or substance use disorders or mental health issues, then we'd get them into housing. Um, as Lila mentioned, that paradigm has been reversed. Now we're getting folks into housing, oftentimes right from the street and wrapping the services around them. Um, we know this model works. Um, we know, as I mentioned, because of some research um, across the country. Um, and for Pine Street Inn, we have a retention rate of about 91%. So those people who are in tend to stay in. And they do because of an intensive um, case management system, which works with each person individually and basically reconnects them to their community. And it's different for each person. Um, some people may need um, some help with legal issues or health issues or employment issues, training issues. Sometimes they're just acclimating back into a community, be it volunteer work or church work. Um, and it's, it's, it's a tender process. And we've tweaked it over the years um, and have found that these 
resources are so important. Um, we, we can figure out how to build the housing. Um, we do it through um, um, conventional financing, accessing federal money, state money. We do private fundraising, um, city funds as well that were mentioned, a collection of all that. But these support services are, are that magic um, bullet here that makes permanent supportive housing work. Um, it's so important, as has been mentioned, that this population of those who are chronically homeless be targeted with this. Um, and um, the, the, for a couple of reasons. One is these folks are actually um, an expensive population to serve or not to serve. They are often, and I'm thinking about the folks that you're seeing on the street, they're high-end utilizers of very expensive forms of care. Ask any district in, in the city, and, and the police are spending um, time responding to their needs. We have EMSs and hospitals. Um, and we know the data shows that once we house those folks, those visits to ER go way, way down, and there's an enormous savings to the healthcare system, um, and and that that's that's a really strong reason to to target this money to this population. Um, we also know, based on research, that for every chronic homeless person that's housed, we're saving about eleven thousand um, dollars. We also know that the most expensive response to homelessness is to do nothing and no intervention at all is quite costly to the city. So whether they're from Boston or not, um, it's, it's really important that we have a response um, to this population. These numbers are low enough so that we could end this. We could end chronic homelessness. Um, to, to the mayor and the city's credit, there's an overarching strategy to this. It's, it's not just you know throwing money here and there. Um, it's putting together, as Lila mentioned, a system that very methodically identifies who these folks are and puts together a plan to get them into permanent supportive housing. And when we can get these folks housed and out of the shelters, it really is going to build capacity on the shelters. It frees up capacity for shelter beds. And at the point where when we can house um, all that are chronic homelessness, then we can add more resources to the shelter so that can, we can really make shelter more of a short-term response rather than a long-term response. So there is um, a, a great strategy in place for this, and, and we applaud the administration, and we are behind it uh, 100%, and um, based on our many years of experience serving homeless individuals and on the research, um, we, we know that this works. So um, I just want to... Um, you know, share that that we Pine Street in are are behind this, and we hope you'll look favorably upon this. And um, I'll take any questions, or you can hear right from Eric. <laughs> Thank you very much, Amy. Eric, welcome. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, just want a quick word. Shout out to the City Council. Thank you for all you, the City Council is working towards and working for. Um, folks out in the street. There's a lot of misinformation out there, and they don't know how hard you guys are working to get them into a roof over their head and a pair of keys in their pocket. And sometimes it's devastating because a lot of folks don't have the patience out there. And a lot of them return to what they were doing before because in their mind they think that it, they're never going to get a set of keys nor a roof over their head. So I just want to say thank you to all the hard work that you guys are doing. In my case, what I had to do is I had to work just as hard as my caseworker was doing. I had to show up for my appointments. I couldn't make excuses. I showed up 15 minutes early. I walked from Jamaica Plain into Boston Housing to be there three hours early just to make sure that I was on time to sign two papers. That's how hard I worked. When nothing in my pocket but lint. And these are the things that our folks out in the streets have to work just as hard as well. This is where the misinformation comes from. They have to work just as hard as well. I wasn't just given this on a platter and say, here, here's your keys, here's your stuff. My file of paperwork is this thick. So I had to work as well, just as hard. So thank you for all your hard work. And thank you for Boston Housing. Thank you for Boston Neighborhood. In my case, what happened with me, I had to realize that Boston EMS wasn't a taxicab service. I, I had to realize that Boston 
that uh, Boston Medical Center wasn't a place for me to lay my head at night. I had to realize Boston PD weren't, they weren't counselors. They couldn't get me what I needed in this world. And essentially what I needed to do was get my head back in order, to not to realize that my tent might get stolen, my nylon condo, if you will, might get stolen. The park majors might come upon it and they might just throw it away. I don't have the, I don't have the funds in my pocket to buy a new tent. So for me, I was pretty much dependent upon the shelter system. Although I'm not today, I'm dependent upon the churches because I try to give back what I freely received. And through all this is that, as a direct result, my medical issues have gone from a 6.4 on my A1C to a, from a 9.4 to a 6.4. My average blood, my blood sugar levels are roughly 132. They were up to around 300 when I was in the shelter system, also in my tent. So yes, it has an adverse effect on us, but also in my case, it makes me feel, when I go and put the keys into my front door, I feel like I'm a part of society again. I took a shower this morning to be here. I shaved, put my glasses on, put my walking shoes on, and I walked here from the South End. And for me, it, I don't walk very well because I had, in 2017, I had half my foot amputated. Uh, I developed a, a sore in Shattuck Shelter, and essentially in Shattuck Shelter, if there's 150 beds, then I'm showering with uh, 149 other guys. So essentially what happened is I developed a blood disease from an open wound. Had half of my foot, had half of my foot amputated. And from there, what I, I was always employed in the city of Boston. What happened is that I work in the kitchen. I went to culinary school. Well, I worked in the kitchen, I couldn't work eight, 12 hours anymore. The shelter system as well, the reason why I ended up in my tent, the shelter system, I, you have to be in by a certain time. A lot of times now, you have, they run out of beds around 3.30, 4 o'clock now. Back when I was in a working man's program, they don't, at Shattuck, they don't have that anymore. So it was either work or show up to get a bed. For me, I chose work to sleep in my tent. These things are now in the process now. I feel better about myself. I, as you can tell, I, I look a lot better than what I did a year ago. But what's important is that I feel better about my situation. I have somebody to talk to. The flip side to it is that I could have just been given a set of keys like most guys do, and then a, a, month, a month later or a week later, they fall off the wagon due to loneliness, despair, not knowing what they're gonna do in their life, but they have a full empty apartment. The issue with those guys is that they don't have any support. They don't know how to reach out. For me, I have a, I have a, a 24 hour number. If anything happens, if I get lock myself out, I have somebody there, 781 number, it's always manned, and I have somebody there to talk to. My caseworker is up from nine to five, and then I have another caseworker as well that I can call, my housing caseworker. He's only supposed to be with me until January, but he's with me today. So the support system is there. I just got recently with Pine Street employment. So I'm going back looking for a part-time job. I, can't, I realize now that I can't work a full-time job. But in my issue, for me, supportive housing works. A lot of times, supportive housing doesn't work for some people. But for the people that it does work, we still have to make that effort to get them housed. Everybody deserves a chance. Everybody deserves a second, third, fourth, and fifth chance. But they do deserve that initial chance. And with this, with this entity that we're, you guys are gonna be voting on soon, will help that. It's not gonna cure anything, but it's gonna immensely help people. And it'll immense people and it'll help people show up for life. And that's what I'm doing today, I'm showing up for life. I'm trying to give back to my community and supportive houses helps me with that. I had a, my caseworker emailed me this morning before I came and said, are you okay with, with getting to City Hall? And I said, yes, I'll be there on time. So these are the things that help amongst the other things. This, the systems are in place. It's up to the people that get supporting houses to use them. So 
all in all, I think Boston's a world-class city, as we tell. And what you city councilor and the mayor of this city, and also the state reps, Congress, everybody is coming together to realize that we got to get these folks housed. And supportive services is there, and it, people need to have a chance at life again. And you guys have that opportunity to make that happen, to be the first in the nation to lead instead of being 49th in the nation. This is a world-class city, and we believe in you as a world-class city council. So please, thank you. Thank you, Eric, uh, for your testimony and for your courage and perseverance and for the shout out for the city council. We'll continue to do the best we can working with the, the mayor and his administration to try to make a difference out there every day. So. Uh, and you, he raises a great point on the D&D because &D, we see that a lot. I see it across the city on the affordable lotteries. Everyone thinks it's just like putting your name on a piece of paper and throwing it into a bowl and someone sh pulling out a name. It's to, to his point in terms of his, his, uh, his work ethic and his perseverance in terms of his words where he has to work just as hard as the caseworker. I mean, not a lot of folks realize that. You have to get your information. You have to be on time. You have to really put your best foot forward. And a lot of folks that... Um, they literally think the affordable lottery is a little just like getting pulled out of a fishbowl and it's, it's much more than that and the more we can do to educate folks as to what the process is and to let folks and share uh, Eric's story uh, with them is that uh, it's a two-way street they got to kind of meet their caseworker halfway they got to put the time and effort in and and hopefully it does turn into a, a roof over the head or keys in their pocket which uh, which was uh, so uh, well described but uh, does my colleague have any questions of either Amy or um, Eric at this time no, thank you, Council Flaherty. I just want to say um, thank you to Amy for everything that Pine Street Inn is doing in helping so many people across our city. And um, thank you to Eric for sharing your story. But more importantly, thank you for your perseverance, as Council Flaherty said, and never giving up hope, even though you've been down um, many times, you keep fighting back. And that's kind of the spirit of Boston is, is never giving up or never giving giving up on people either. Um, everybody deserves a second or a third, a third chance or a fourth chance. And um, I'm glad that you're here with us and you're a testament of, of what this city is all about. It. It's, it's working hard, it's, it's being compassionate and caring and being there for people that really need, need our help. So thank you, for, um, thank you for your determination and hard work as well, Eric. Thank you, Council Flynn, and that will conclude the public testimony of this portion, so I appreciate your time and attention. And uh, with respect to the panel, docket uh, 0644, we'll get a committee report turned around and get it before the council um, for a uh, council vote, uh, most likely, uh, depending on scheduling, probably by next uh, our next council session is what we'll strive to try to get that done. So, uh, so on behalf of the council, thank you to Justin, thank you to Marcy, and thank you to, to Layla for the work that you do, not just here, but every day trying to make a difference in the lives of uh, our fellow Bostonians. And uh, with that, uh, the Committee on Government Operations with respect to docket 0644 is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>